Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so it all starts with uh, the work of Buzzard and Taylor in the 90s. Uh, so th that this uh, beautiful idea that to prove modularity of Galois representations, uh, you can use analytic continuation of overconvergent modular forms. So basically, you start with the Galois representation. You produce some overconvergent periodic modular forms. Um, and then uh, which r give rise to that and then try to find some linear combination of those or something out of those that uh, is a form that actually extends analytically to, to a classical one and that proves uh, the modularity. And so let me first uh, write down the, the results from this work and then I'll explain how to generalize it and what are the obstacles in doing so and how uh, this is an iPad. <laughs> yeah, I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> I might. Uh, okay, so, um, so let's say P is a prime bigger than 2, K over QP, finite extension. We have the ring of integers, OK, and the maximal ideal M. Uh, I have a Galois representation from GQ to GL to OK, which satisfies the following. So it, is, uh, it ramifies with only finitely many primes. Uh, the restriction of rho to a decomposition group at P is the direct sum of two characters, alpha, beta, which are unramified, and let's say distinct modulo m, and rho bar is modular and, for example, absolutely reducible. If you have a Galois representation like that, then rho is modular in weight 1. Okay, now let, me, let me try and explain um, how the idea of analytic continuation can be used in, in the proof of this theorem. Um, so first of all, so this is, the proof is really a, a combination of two types of methods. So one is the methods of uh, Taylor Wiles, and the other one is this new idea of analytic continuation. Uh, so first of all, using alpha and beta and switching them, you can produce two uh, deformation rings, ordinary deformation rings. And then you can prove that those deformation rings are 
equal to Hecke rings, Hido Hecke rings. And you take those and it's specialized at weight one and you produce two weight one modular points, which are not necessarily classical because you are specializing in weight one. So you're gonna get yourself two piadic ordinary, so overconvergent uh, eigenforms of weight one. And as I said, using FNG, you want to produce a classical one. Um, so what do you do? Uh, first of all, you can arrange for this to be such that F and G have same Hecke eigenvalues away from P. And at P, we have UPF is alpha F and UPG is beta G. Alpha beta coming from the statement. And the idea is to show that alpha f minus beta g, which is an overconvergent form, uh, is uh, classical. Uh, in fact, classical of level prime to p. Okay. Um, so let me, let me explain a little bit about this, uh, the process of analytic continuation. All right, so I want to prove uh, alpha f minus beta g is classical of level prime to p. So let me take the prime to p level modular curve. So, but I want to work uh, with the rigid analytic version of that. So a rigid analytic modular curve of level prime to P. And so on X, you have a notion of valuation. Let's call it V. So to every point on X, you can associate a valuation, which is basically, which measures the super singularity of its reduction mod P, okay? So if the valuation is always in zero, one, if the valuation is zero, you have an or ordinary reduction, and the more valuation, you think of it as being more super singular um, mod P. And this is really just the valuation of a lift of Hasse invariant locally, okay? So once you have this, then you can, you can think of your, you can think of admissible uh, opens inside X by giving it some, you, know, you have an interval I can define xi to be all points where the valuation belongs to that interval i. And f and g are going to be sections of the usual sheaf omega on x of zero epsilon for some epsilon uh, for some positive epsilon. Okay? Um, and the idea is to show that alpha f minus beta g extends analytically from x of zero epsilon to x of zero one, which is the entire x. So you have a section of omega on the entire anal rigid analytic modular curve, and then you can use the rigid analytic gaga to, sh to show that, in fact, it is uh, alpha f minus beta g is, in fact, algebraic, an algebraic section of omega, and therefore it's classical as we want, okay? All right, so this is sort of the formalism. Now, of course, the point is how do you extend from x0 epsilon to x0 one, okay? And I want to explain that. Um, now, first of all, I should say that we can guess, if, if we assume the problem has a, is solved, we can guess that the answer should be alpha f minus beta g, um, because you think of f and g as p established. Uh, oh, first of all, 
uh, because of the unramified con uh, condition here, you can assume that you can find uh, some H which gives rise to this, which has level prime to P. And then you can think of F and G as P stabilizations of that H. So you can, you can write down the linear combination of F and G, which is equal to H. And that's going to be alpha F minus beta to G. Okay. If you want to normalize, you divide by alpha minus beta. So that one we are given. Uh, how do you, well, how did uh, Buzzard and Taylor prove this? analytic continuation. Okay, so I'm going to give a modified version of their argument, which is really a, a mix of that argument with uh, something that Bozer did later on, which is a generalization uh, to the case that uh, alpha and beta are not uh, unramified. They have some ramification. So, so it's modified, because this is what I will use. So I, I will explain this, but it's essentially the same thing. So instead of working on x, I'm going to work on y, which is you add level gamma naught p. Okay? And what does y look like? Same as x, you can define uh, evaluation on y, which again varies between 0 and 1. It is slightly different now because you have the ordinary locus is going to be ha going to have two connected components, okay? So the multiplicative part and the et al part. And so here the valuation is going to be zero on this part, one on this part, and varies from zero to one in the super singular locus, okay? And so you have, just like before, F and G are sections on Y of zero and epsilon for some positive epsilon. So if this is my epsilon, I'm gonna have a section here. So two sections here, F and G, yeah? So alpha F minus beta G is going to be the section defined on this part. There's also a, an atkin learner evolution that sends an elliptic curve and a subgroup to the quotient of that elliptic curve with the subgroup and the complementary subgroup. And what it does the, to the valuations, valuation of W of Q is one minus valuation of Q, okay? So if I take this, if I look at W of F minus G, okay? That's going to be defined on this going from one minus epsilon to one. Now imagine that we can prove that epsilon is large enough so that these two regions have an overlap first, and second, that these two uh, sections uh, agree on that overlap. Then that means that we have proven that alpha f minus beta g has extended to the entire modular curve. Okay? So that's, that's the idea, so show F and G extend to X of zero epsilon for large epsilon, large enough epsilon. And show alpha F minus beta G equals W of F minus G on the overlap. Well, this shows you that alpha f minus beta g, in fact, shows both f and g are classical, but alpha f minus beta g is classical on y, and then it's not difficult to see that you can actually descend it from y to x, okay? So finally, alpha f minus beta g descends So, yeah, so the idea is, so the, the main point, which was completely uh, novel at the time, was that how do you extend these forms to a bigger domain? Sorry. 
Now, let me go back to the to my own setting and try and explain how we want to uh, generalize this argument. So we want to extend this to the context of Hilbert modular forms. So let me assume that L is a totally real field. Um, and P is bigger than 2 prime. And I'm going to assume that P is unramified in L. Okay. Let me first give you the statement of the result. So again, k over qp is finite. We have ok, we have m, we have rho from gq from gl to gl to ok, which has exactly the same properties. So ramifies rho ramifies at finitely many places. Restriction of rho to So for any prime dividing p, restriction of rho to a decomposition group at that prime p is, as before, the, disjoint, the, the direct sum of two characters, such that alpha p and beta p are uh, unramified, distinct mod m, and 3 row bar modular plus uh, absol uh, absolutely reducible and restricted to Galva group of Q bar over L of some zeta P. Okay, now I wanted to put a fourth uh, condition here, which for the applications uh, we can always, applications I have in mind, we can always guarantee. And that's that row bar has an ordinary lift. So I put it like this, row bar has an ordinary lift. Um, first of all, for, for large prime, this is always uh, now proven to be exist, uh, this such a lift. But for small primes, uh, we can arrange this for applications. Now, I should say that uh, the work of Buzzard and Taylor was part of a program that that, re that Taylor had uh, uh, devised to prove cases, certain cases of Artin conjecture, and uh, which, which happened. And of course, our motivation for doing this kind of result is to prove results like that. Uh, I mean, the rest is, yeah, the rest of the argument to prove, uh, to, to prove applications to Artin are, are direct generalizations of uh, 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 Taylor's method. Okay, then what happens? <laughs> then rho, the rho is rho f. So f is a Hilbert modular form of uh, parallel weight one. And level prime to p. Um, I will I will explain at the end related work by uh, Piloni and also a joint work that I'm doing with uh, uh, Sasaki and Tian. So let's, let's think about this. What, what can we do? First of all, if P is a split in the totally real field, then this is due to Sasaki. is generalizing the, the Buzzard-Taylor method again. 
So what happens in general? So in general, it, first of all, it is enough to, sh uh, enough to, so in general, it's enough to deal with the inert case. So just repeat the same argument, and you get two. In this case, you get two, because you have only one prime above B. You get two overconversion Hilbert modular forms of weight one, such that same eigenvalues away from P. And again, UPF is alpha f and upg is beta g are the eigenvalues at p. And of course, we want to do it the same thing. Yeah? We want to consider alpha f minus beta g and f minus g and show that these two glue, each, uh, glue to each other and prove, prove the result. The, the, the complication that uh, appears in the inert case is that we can show that alpha, alpha f minus beta g is defined on some open u, and therefore this is defined on some open w, but uh, u, and you can actually show that they intersect each other, non, you know, there's a non-empty intersection, but the union of u and w u is small. In fact, the union of U and W, U is going to miss tubes of entire components, or not entire components, but like a dense opens inside entire components of the special fiber. So we have to find a way to make this U bigger, bigger than what, what naturally comes out of the methods. So the problem is really the existence of uh, horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical components in the special fiber of, of Y, the gamma naught P in that case. Right. Now in order to be able to explain the problem better and also uh, tell you what the solution is, I need to take a digression and talk about the geometry of this uh, Hilbert modular varieties mod P. So geometry of Hilbert modular varieties mod P. Um, so I'm going to explain to you these, these, these vertical components. So I'm in the same situation. I'm assuming that P is unramified in L. In fact, uh, inert for this talk. And so O is OL, and O mod P is kappa, is the residue field. And I consider W of kappa, and I consider sigma to be the Frobenius that acts on both of these. And I want uh, the set of indices. Everything is going to decompose. Well, not everything. Some things are going to decompose to G different components which are indexed by set of embeddings of OL and W kappa. So if you fix one, the rest, because of the inert assumption, are going to be powers of Frobenius composed with that. So you get G indices, or G directions if you want. And then I have my X and Y. Um, let me put it here. Then I have my X and Y, which is the, this is the Hilbert modular variety in level prime to P. And this is, let's say, gamma 1 N. P doesn't divide N. And this is level gamma 1 N intersection gamma naught P. 
and there is a natural projection from y to x which sends uh, you know an abelian variety with abelian scheme with um, the extra uh, data and a subgroup to just the abelian variety okay of course I can look at the special fiber of this these are integral models and I can also look at the rigid analytic versions of their generic fibers and I'm, I'm working with toroidal compactifications of y and x so I'm not going to put it in the notation so I consider the special fiber and the rigid analytic version um, right, so I want to tell you about X bar and Y bar okay in for X bar this was studied by Goren and Ort and they, they defined a type stratification W tau, tau is a subset of uh, this uh, B. So what is type? Type is the directions in which uh, kernel of Frobenius and kernel of Verschiebung has non, have non-zero intersection. Okay? So you get some, some of the elements, indices in B, and that's your type. And W tau is exactly all uh, points where the type is equal to tau. Okay? So this gives you a stratification. And what I'm going to use from this is the fact that the co-dimension, first of all, that this is a stratification, and also that the co-dimension of W tau in X bar is uh, the cardinality of tau. Okay. Uh, for Y bar, I'm going to use a little bit more. Um, I'm going to use uh, a little bit more closely the geometry of Y bar because I want to be working over Y bar and do gluing over Y bar. Um, okay, what, what do I need? Uh, so in a joint work with Goren, we studied uh, a stratification on this, W phi eta, where phi and eta are now two subsets, of, uh, two subsets of B. There is some admissibility condition, which is L phi C is inside eta, where L is the left shift uh, composing with sigma minus one, and C is the complement. So L phi C must be inside eta. Um, and wh what is this uh, stratification? It's basically you look at the subgroup uh, in, in AC, and you measure uh, how close it is to the kernel of Frobenius or kernel of Verschiebung at different indices, whether it is equal to those or not. Okay. And you get you get three to the g strata here, two to the g strata here. Now I want to tell you more about this because I, I, I need that. So the way to understand this stratification is to look at a picture that uh, sort of a combinatorial picture that allows us to visualize how these different strata are. Uh, situated with respect to each other, so how they specialize to each other. So let me consider the cube uh, 0, 1 to the power b, so it's a g-dimensional hypercube. Um, I need, okay, let's put here. And what we show is that the strata are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the faces. Um, maybe faces, I'm, I, I'm going to use faces, but by faces I mean everything, like vertices, edges, faces, interior, everything. So there are three to the g of those, yes. And so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, which is order reversing in every sense, meaning that the way that the strata specialize to each other, 
you can see it here in the reverse order. Okay? And for example, the dimensions are complementary. So if you look at the highest dimensional strata correspond to the lowest dimensional faces, which are exactly the vertices of, of this cube. And then the lowest, strat uh, the lowest dimensional strata, which are zero dimensional and are still super special points with the kernel of Frobenius, correspond to the interior of the cube. And there are you know, all other possibilities. So let me give it a name. So uh, W phi eta uh, corresponds to some A phi eta. Okay. And what else? Um, So that, that's, that allows you to, to visualize y bar, but also it allows you to visualize the generic fiber, y, by means of evaluation uh, function. So, so that, oops, that's y bar and this is y. Th these are the two things that we are interested in. And here, for any q, you send it to v underline of q, which is a, va a vector of valuations that we can define for them. Again, these are all between 0 and 1. So this is similarly defined for the valuation on y that I didn't explain really, but I don't have time. So and these actually can be also independently defined in terms of the subgroup. Uh, but the way we define them are using parameters that appear in the deformation space. So um, yeah. so, so you have this valuation. So every point here is going to give you a point here, basically, inside this queue by, terms, by uh, using this valuation. And of course, you expect uh, that uh, a point Q, the valuation of a vector of a point belongs to A phi eta, if and only uh, Q bar, the specialization of Q belongs to the corresponding uh, strata. OK, so this is good way to visualize the spaces that we're going to work with. But um, I, the way I've written it is, is a, a bit of a combinatory, combi combinatorial nature. Really, the, the geometry goes into proving that not only is the strata are specialized in this way, but also the irreducible components of the strata are specialized this way. So the picture is uniform. Um, so you, you can really, if you, if you refine your stratification by taking the irreducible components of all strata, then you can visualize your space by a number of these cubes. Uh, and the picture is always uniform. And that's something that is important in proving. I'm going to need to, uh, to prove that certain uh, regions in the middle of the, or in the middle of the, um, uh, of Y, the region analytic Y, are connected. And that's how I can prove them. OK, so, so now, now what? Oh, oh, let me make a definition here. I want to work with a simpler uh, valuation. That was underlined V. This is V, and this is sum of V beta. Okay. For this argument, I will use only this one, not the partial valuations. Um, and whenever I have an in, so this belongs to uh, zero g. Yeah, it gives the dimension goes from zero to g. And if I have an interval inside this, then something like this makes sense. Everything whose valuation v belongs to that, I, that interval. Um, okay, and, and so therefore, let me first remind you what an overconvergent Hilbert modular form is. You can think of it in this notation as so these are both sections of omega on y of 0 and epsilon, or some epsilon uh, bigger than 0. Okay, now let me, I think I'm in a position to tell you what goes wrong here. So maybe before that, 
let me see. I, I don't have time, so I'll just um, just carry on. Mm. Okay, so l let me explain what goes wrong. The, the natural place that you can show that this F and G uh, con analytically continue to are is actually the following open. So all Q such that V beta Q plus P V sigma minus one O beta Q is less than P for all beta in, in V, okay? So if you, for example, if G equals two, this is going to be your space. I mean, I, I, I didn't explain uh, the example, uh, but maybe I can do it here. So this is for G equals two and P is inert, okay? Uh, first of all, maybe I should say that there are four types of reducible components for Weibull. Uh, and uh, this one corresponds to the kernel of Frobenius and kernel of Verschiebung here. These are the two horizontal ones that map fi in a finite flat manner. But these two, um, these two are vertical and they mapped on to one dimensional locus on X bar, okay? And these are all the intersections and so on. Now, th in this picture, U can is the following. Okay. Now, if I take U can and flip it with W and take the union, in this case, I'm going to get everything but these two A and B. Okay. So the union of those two is going to miss exactly, in this case, exactly the tube of, tube of B and tube of A. Okay. Uh, in general, it's even smaller. This is special. Um, so that's the problem. So how does one analytically continue F to a big region anyway? I mean, if you think about it, F and G are defined here. Yeah? So this is your value. You can think of it as the valuation thing. Yeah? So F and G are defined here. And you want to extend this analytically to bigger and bigger places. And I said you can, you can do it up to here, for example. Okay? How does one do that? Well, one way to do it is. Uh, Exactly. I'm going to use that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes. So this is a uh, method that Buzzard used, the uh, idea of Buzzard, that you, you write f as 1 over alpha upf. So this is your functional equation. And you want to show that, well, if it's defined in a certain region, Maybe UPF is defined in a bigger region, and therefore F is defined in the bigger region, and keep repeating that to get bigger and bigger regions, okay? And so that's how you would do uh, to prove it on the UCAN. How does, it, how, how does it work in general? Okay, so let me make some definitions. Uh, so I'm going to replace UCAN with something uh, bigger than UCAN, and try and prove the same kind of result. So I'm gonna define y cardinality of tau less than one to be all q in y such that the specialization, the type of the specialization has cardinality at most one. So it contains all the ordinary points, ordinary reduction points, and some more, okay? And similarly, I can define this for tau, for x, sorry. And here is my definition for the initial region to begin with, so I want to define R to be, take this and look at uh, the part that has valuation going from zero to G minus delta open, and delta is the sum of one over P to the I, I goes from one to G minus one. Now let me draw a picture and show you how, what it looks like. Okay, 
So in G equals 2 and P inert, the cardinality of tau is going to be 0 here, 0 here, 1 here. And in these places, it's going to be sometimes 1, sometimes 2. OK? That's the cardinality of tau. Uh, and in the middle, is 2. And what I'm considering, I'm throwing out in the middle, um, the middle. I'm considering the middle doesn't matter because of what you said. The middle has co-dimension uh, bigger than 1 in, in this specialization. Okay. So I, I'm happy to ignore it, but these are problematic. But here, when I consider type 1, I'm going to get only part of this and part of this. And here, so it's uh, the, the middle removed and some removed from each of these. Now, when I put that condition here, it means I start from valuation zero and I go up to something here. So in this case, it's g minus delta is two minus some something. So you go a little bit over one. Okay. All right. So this is my region. As R. And you know, Y is a disjoint union of connected components, and R correspondingly is a so R A is R intersection with Y A, okay? Because I'm considering the full modular variety. Okay, now let me tell you how to prove this. First, step one. Um, so prove that every overconvergent Hilbert modular form F such that UPF is not zero extends analytically to R. Okay. So to prove this, this is uh, the main calculation of this uh, this method. You hear you you, you use that uh, as a, that uh, functional equation. And you calculate where the, the Hecke correspondence goes using uh, calculations with Kissing modules. And it's crucial in this calculation to consider the fact that type has cardinality 1, because that gives you something for free. In general, it becomes very complicated. Okay? So that allows you to prove that. Which one? Is the type less than equal to one is preserved by the uh, No, it's not. No. Yeah. Um, a type less than or equal to one is preserved. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but it's possible that you, yeah, but, but, the, but, um, when you go to type bigger than two, then it may not work. Yeah, but that one is preserved because somehow it's a, that, that's what allows you to do this. Yeah. yeah. So step two is F extends to R union WR. Okay. Um, How does one do that? Okay, now here there's something that I want to explain. I hope it doesn't take a long time because it is actually important for generalizations of this. Um, so consider the modular variety that gives you A, C, D, C, D, and R are like subgroups as before, but C is different from D. And then you're going to have two maps, pi 1 and pi 2, where the one that uh, forgets D and the one that quotients out by D. Okay? So we have this standard thing. And we want to show, oh, okay. First of all, to show this, I want to show, this is, this is not correct, yeah? Um, 
this is uh, alpha f minus beta g. Sorry. So I want to show that alpha f minus beta g equals w of f minus g on r intersection w r. If I show that, that I've proven this, of course. Yeah. OK, but instead of showing this, we, we can show something which is weaker slash stronger than that. And that is pi 1 upper star of alpha f minus beta g is pi 2 upper star of f minus g on pi 1 inverse of r, which is contained in the pi 2 inverse of r. So this makes sense. Uh, here you have to put really projection upper star to make it uh, sections of the same thing. So yeah, well, you, you prove that the, under this, the pullbacks, these two things are equal. It's not exactly that. But how, first of all, how do, you, how do you show this? You use Q expansions. That, that shows you around a small, over a small uh, open. And then you have to show, that you have to use the fact that each RA is in fact connected. Okay. So RA, so R was this thing. R, Y is the disjoint union of YA. Those are the connected components. And R is the, RA is the intersection of R with YA. So they are actually connected in each reducible component. And that allows you to prove something like this. Now, why doesn't it give you the desired equality? Because here you have like A over D. Here you have AC. Like you, don't have, you don't have the same, because pi 1 and pi 2 quotient are by different thing. Uh, w and pi 2 quotient are by two different things. But if you have this equality, not just for A, C, D, but for A, C, and some other D prime, and actually, if you have it for A, C, and three values of D, then you can just do some uh, you know, cancellation and show that that implies this. So what do I need? I need my R intersection W not, uh, to, to contain not only whenever it contains A, C, D, for it to contain A, C, and two other values of D. Okay. For me to be able to pass from that to that. So the answer, the solution to that is that I don't consider R intersection WR. I consider a subdomain inside that, which is given by the following formula. Okay. So it's a smaller. Um, instead of going from 1 to g minus delta, it goes from g minus 1 to g minus delta. And what's nice about this is that using, again, Kissing module calculations, we can show that this C is saturated under pi. So C is pi inverse of some C0. Okay? So that little trick that I want to use, it's OK on C. So that, that weaker thing actually tells you this, but only on C. Okay. It's a bit of a technical point, but I want to mention it because, as I said, it matters for the, general, for the generalizations of this. So um, it shows, okay, in short, all of this shows me the following. That alpha f minus beta g equals w of f minus g. This is my desired equality, but I can only prove it on C which is smaller than our intersection WR. Now here is where you use the geometry. You show that C intersects every connected component of our intersection WR. And that, that proves it over, that proves it over the, the desire, desired uh, region. Okay? All right. Anyway, so the point being that here I need to really understand what's happening in the middle of my moduli space in terms of geometry. And finally, uh, the, the last step is step three, alpha f minus beta g is classical. All right, now we can talk about the point that you raised. Now, if I, if I look at R union WR, you cannot apply that Hartog's lemma or what I call kosher lemma to it because the complement of this still 
it does it, it no longer contains uh, tubes of connected component but it contains tubes of uh, co-dimension one things so it, you can't apply hard. however however it contains this okay and the image of this is this but here the complement of this is the tube of something of co-dimension two or higher okay so if I could show that my thing descends down here then I can now extend it and again pull back okay so the point is now to show that how alpha f minus beta g descends down here now I'm going to use my c again because it's a fully saturated domain and you know the rest is All right, so basically I just write descend alpha f minus beta g from y tau less than or equal to 1 to x tau less than or equal to 1. Extend to x using a, a rigid analytic, uh, what I call a kosher principle. And and that's it, because uh, we, we have proven that our thing is classical of level uh, prime to p. Um, yeah, just uh, just to, to mention that for the descent argument, um, it's enough basically to show that it descends over a over a over a region uh, over a, over an open, and I'm going to take that to be c zero and c. So basically, you go from c to c zero under pi and if you go back to our nice formula here this is what guarantees that um, alpha f minus beta g descends from c to c0 because when you write this it tells you that the value of alpha f minus beta g is independent of the subgroup c so you write it for all possible for all possible um, free images of a point here and you see that it is actually Independent of the. All right. Uh, but this is a finite flat map, so you can take the trace of it. You can take the trace of a thing from upstairs. Uh -huh. And then when you pull it back, <laughs> it's going to be like a degree times uh, the original thing. So that's uh, now. I wanted to use to, uh, these last uh, five minutes uh, to say a bit about generalizations of this and other um, other results similar to this. So I guess where, I'm, where am I here? So we want to. Okay. So if you notice, I used uh, both a gluing and a descent argument, both of those. There is really, in the case that I am dealing with, which is the unramified, alpha and beta being unramified, there is a way to uh, not do any gluing and just do descent. Okay? But if you wanted to do this argument for the case where alpha and beta, for example, alpha over beta is tamely ramified, You can only work on y, yeah? so you can you really have to use this kind of gluing argument uh, to be able to prove this result. Okay, so you're going to have to be to understand what happens uh, in the middle spaces in the middle parts of your moduli space. So uh, Piloni has has proved what, what I have just uh, explained to you uh, with the for an for L, which is a slightly ramified so for like p is slightly ramified in l so yeah so this this came out uh, a bit after i did this and it is uh, pretty much the same argument uh, except that in the so p is slightly ramified allows you to uh, to get enough analytic continuation and then the rest is the same except that at the very end what you get 
you get to this, but also to the, to the Rappaport locus of this. But it's still, you can prove that you can, that also has co-dimension, you know, characteristic P has co-dimension bigger than one, so the same uh, argument works. But if you wanted to allow even a slight ramification and allow tame, uh, alpha over beta to be tame ramified, you are going to need much more to be able to do this kind of gluing. So with um, Sasaki and Tian, we, we proved this case. And now here no longer you can use the, uh, the kosher principle immediately because what you have is not, does not satisfy that. So you have to do more and more analytic continuation. And then uh, there also we, we, we do some applications to Artin. Uh, conjectures, same as uh, as Richard's arguments. Okay. Um, yeah, there is there is one case that we are still uh, trying to work out, and that's when alpha over beta has wild ramification. Something that uh, the existence of certain integral models uh, is a bit of a sticking sticking point. Uh, I think I, I will stop here.